Well, hopefully you've tuned in to 87.9, and uh, we do thank you for obeying as best as you can all of the rules. This could be an eventful day, and we'll watch people run around down the parking lot to their papers and things. They said there could be up to 50 mile an hour winds today, so uh, thank you all for coming. We can't really see you because of the glare on your windshield. So you can rotate. flash your lights at us or something like that if you'd like to uh, let us know that you're alive and well. Uh, but we're so glad that you have come today to New Harvest to uh, share in this wonderful service. Uh, hopefully it's coming across well in your speakers and your sound system at 87.9. We do have some ambient sound up here for you too. Um, but we're looking forward to this service today. It's the first, the closest thing that we can have to a live service at this point in time. And we hope that you enjoy it today and that you are uh, blessed. And uh, let's just open this service in prayer. Father, we thank you today uh, for the grace that you've given us. Lord, that we can be here together and uh, gather. Lord Jesus, even though we're distanced from one another, we know the Lord God that you are close and that you are with us. And Father, that we are together in spirit and in truth, and that, Lord, we worship together today in spirit and truth. Father, let your grace be present in all things, Lord, that you could be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
that worship is going to happen no matter what happens on this earth no matter what happens in these church buildings no matter where we are if we're in a car if we're on a tractor if we're sitting in our living rooms watching Facebook Lord we worship you we thank you so much Lord thank you for this opportunity to be together the way we are right here at our home church we love you Lord and we thank you and we give you all the glory. Let's uh, give me a big horn shake. <laughs> You're going to have to bear with me for a second. My name is Peter, by the way. And I'm coming to you live from the first century. Let me go back to being Scott for a second. Who likes On the Farm with Ryan and Scott? It's amazing though. The puppies got more views than their church than their church services. Yeah. And just more, a little heads up. More uh, than our Sunday morning yeah. live, more than our uh, daily On the Farm or In the Woods, Kim, and the puppies have the number one viewer rating on Facebook Live. <laughs> so, what's coming next is Ellie Mae Clampett, i.e. Kim Christman's got uh, baby ducks. So, there'll probably be a one about ducks. <laughs> My 
My name is Peter, the chief of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have a reputation of being brash and loud, speaking before thinking and acting before knowing. Now how exactly I uh, may have become this particular person is the very most interesting story of all. I was not qualified for who Jesus made me become. But perhaps that's the very best story of all that I want to tell you about. My friends, my fellow workers of the gospel of Jesus, they know all of my flaws too. My friend Mark shows how inept that I am. My friend Paul had to correct me to my face in the middle of a church dinner. And he also found me sometimes shallow and unconvincing. My friend John respected me, but pointed out that he was faster than I was when he received news of the tomb of our Lord Jesus was empty. How does the old saying go? With friends like these, who needs enemies? But in all truth, I am glad that they told those things about me. Thank God that he has a soft spot for failures like myself. Sinners. He had a soft spot for sinners like me. In fact, that was my first interaction with Jesus. Jesus told me to follow him by the shores of the Lake of Galilee. And I was fishing with my family on the sea. And Jesus came and he asked to use my boat. I'm still not sure why he chose me exactly. But I can tell you that of all that night, it was an extreme failure. We fished all evening and caught nothing. And yet miraculously, Jesus comes and then he makes my fishing failure a huge success. I fell at his feet and realized that I was in the presence of the Lord. I acknowledged my failures and wanted him to leave my boat, but he stayed and he called me to follow him. But to understand this, you have to understand the backstory. You have to know that all the other rabbis, all the other teachers of the law, they had rejected me. When I wanted to go further and study under a rabbi, I had to seek them out. But Jesus came to me and asked me to follow him. Jesus told me, from now on, you will catch people. At that moment, I believe that I had committed myself to a new way of life. Or at least, that's what I thought. However, I failed at that part of my life also. Somehow, in my inabilities, Jesus seemed to make them capitalize on all of them. Somehow, in my inabilities, Jesus capitalizes on them and he made a divine example of me. I fail, and yet in my failures, Jesus is glorified. And Jesus is contrasted with me in that he is always successful. And in Jesus, Jesus takes my failures and turns them into his own glory. I'm telling you that no good thing that I've done was of my own hands or on my own efforts. They were all Jesus and what he has done in me. He living inside me. One particular failure happened when Jesus had put all the demonic forces of the unseen realm on notice. Jesus stood there before the shrines and the temples of the pagan gods and at the foothills of Mount Hermon. I stood there at Caesarea Philippi, Mount Hermon behind us, and Jesus said that the gates of hell would never prevail against this church. But immediately after he did this, Jesus started speaking about going to the cross, about death, about suffering, about crucifixion. And then I told him that this would not happen, that he would not go to the cross, that he was just speaking a bunch of nonsense. And he turned and he rebuked me. He called me Satan. And in the midst of that, I realized that my heart was totally broken before him. And then I knew that Jesus' plans were not my plans. The contrast was with my will and God's will would not have been so more evident at that time. And I began to question everything. 
what I was doing to following Jesus. Chief Apostle, give me a break. But I suppose that I would like to say like Paul did. For this very reason, I was shown mercy. That in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience and as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. I'll never forget we were on the outskirts of my hometown of Bethsaida. And many of my friends and family were there as the crowds had gathered. 5,000 men present at that point in time, plus women and children. It's amazing to see maybe the largest crowd I've ever seen with my own eyes at the time. And Jesus preached, and ex I expected it to go like normal. People enthralled with the message, and then would come out and be healed. But that's not how it went this time. The people were hungry. They'd been out in the pastures for days listening to Jesus. And so the people were fed by Jesus. And miraculously, he multiplied fish and bread. It was amazing. Even though I wish that he may have multiplied a little bit of butter and hot sauce for the fish at that particular time. But that's a different story. It was so hard. Hard to under comprehend. And hard to understand. Jesus said, you must eat my body and you must drink my blood or you have no part with me. And everybody left. Friends, cousins, family members. They all walked away. But we 12 disciples, we stayed. And then like a dagger to my heart, Jesus turned to us and asked us, are you going to leave too? And at that moment, I saw the suffering servant Isaiah talked about. I saw it on the cross too, for sure. And of the scourging pain that he experienced, but I saw the pain of rejection. I saw the pain of criticism. I saw the wounds of a savior that was the suffering servant that I saw. Seeking to comfort him, I said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the ways of eternal life. And I have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And he didn't need my affirmation, but I think he was glad that I spoke up. You know, so much in Jesus' ministry revolved around the bread and the fish. So much revolved around the table. I watched lives transformed before the very eyes at the dinner table. Zacchaeus, Levi, prostitutes, liars, thieves, and even Samaritans, Pharisees, Sadducees. I saw people deeply addicted to sin, radically changed by Jesus sharing a meal with them. But there was one meal, the meal that radically changed my life. And that was the Last Supper when he went to the cross. And there at the table, he broke the bread and he said that it was his body. And he gave us the wine and he said that it was his blood. And immediately, I thought of the feeding of the 5,000 and how the people left him. And it wasn't until later that I found out that he was talking about the cross. And after the meal, he asked us to go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with him. And he asked me to pray, but three times I fell asleep in the garden. Falling asleep seems to be a normal thing for me. Failure again. I fell into the water. I fell asleep. Maybe those three failures that night of falling asleep were a foreshadowing of the failures that I had that night even worse. There in the garden, Jesus was arrested. Once again, in my rage, in my failure, I realized what was happening, and I took out my sword, and I cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. But I couldn't even do that right. I was aiming for his neck, but I got his ear instead. But Jesus undid what I had failed to do. That night, he healed the man's ear. And Jesus reversed my failures once again. And then I realized Jesus didn't mean to carry a sword. He meant to carry a sword, the Word of God. He didn't mean to cut with a sword that would divide the flesh.
but a sword that would cut the deepest part of the soul. The words of Jesus are the sword. But then I followed him to the trial that he stood that night. And three times I denied him. Three times I failed again. I heard the rooster crow and Jesus turned and he looked at his, my eyes met his. And I knew it. I knew my failures had gotten the best of me now. I didn't think there was any reversing this. I wept the most bitter tears I wept before. The pain of my soul was so deep, I didn't know if I would make it to see the next day. It wasn't just Jesus I denied, it was his words. The words of eternal life, the miracles, the demons cast out, the resurrections I saw take place from the dead. I denied three years of my life. I denied that I really left everything to follow him. You see, that was the biggest failure of all. After Jesus was crucified, I went back to fishing. Echoing in my mind at every cast of the net, I could hear the words of Jesus say, from now on, you will catch people. From now on, you will catch people. From now on, you will catch people. Except that I was out on the sea catching fish. And at that moment, he called me, I thought in my heart that I had left everything behind. All that I had, my father, the business, fishing, everything to follow Jesus. Until the day that I went back to fishing. After three years of ministry with Jesus, I went back to my old way of life and I failed again. It was like fishing was right there. My old way of life, it was familiar, a comfort, a fail safe. And I went back to it. Like a dog back to its own vomit, I returned to something I had said I'd never do again. I'd only fish for people and no longer fish for fish. Failure after failure. But then Jesus shows up the same way that he always did. I thought it wouldn't happen this time. And there he was, I on the boat with the others. And the resurrected Lord Jesus calls out to the boat. He said, won't you try it my way this time? Cast your net on the other side of the boat. At that moment, we caught the huge number of fish. And I jumped in the water and swam to shore. I knew it was Jesus standing there. And then I realized it wasn't just about the first time that Jesus called me while I was fishing. Jesus was recreating the last time that I failed him. He had a coal fire burning and he cooked fish. It was just like the fire that I was standing near to warm myself the night that I denied him three times. The bread, the coals, the fish it was just like the Last Supper. It was the night that Jesus was repeating. Suddenly I felt the pain of that evening that I betrayed Jesus begin to surge in my heart again. And then everything changed. Jesus gave me the moment of redemption. And three times he asked if I loved him. Three times I answered correctly this time. Why? Why does he keep giving me new chances? Why does he keep pursuing me? The answer is in the question. Do you love me? I love Jesus. I love people imperfectly and yet he loves me perfectly what I want you to notice about this story and my story is not the faith that I put in Jesus what I want you to notice about this story is instead more incredible and unbelievable than that I want you to notice the faith that Jesus put into me into Simon Peter the one who Jesus called the rock, even though most of my life was unpredictable as the waves and the weather on the sea. Despite my failures, Jesus made me successful. Jesus found me by an empty boat. My companions and I were the least successful fishermen on the beach, which is the only reason my boat was empty, which was the only reason was because of my failure that Jesus was able to teach the crowds that day because of the emptiness I had in my life. Jesus didn't find me in a synagogue 
were in a temple where the holy people hang out and work. I wasn't a priest. I was a fisherman. And yet Jesus wanted me on his team. He chose me and he chooses you today. You see, both the first and the last words of Jesus are the same. Despite my failures, they're the same words. Follow me were the first words, and follow me were the last words of Jesus. And today, Jesus is asking you the same question. Will you follow me? No matter what has happened in between, no matter what has happened since the first time that Jesus called you, no matter how many failures you've had, you can be a follower of Jesus too. So today, let's pray. Father, Jesus, I thank you that we can be followers and that you have called me with the same words at the beginning as you do today, all of us. Will you follow me? And Lord, I ask that as we celebrate your resurrection, as we celebrate today, your infinite grace and mercy, despite our failures, then Lord, that you would radically resurrect hearts and change lives by the power of the blood and the body of Jesus that was broken for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. The one, the only name that's above all names. The name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
we thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's an incredible amount of work. Would you give these guys a beep or a hug? Or a hug? Thank you guys so much for coming today. We greatly appreciate you. We love you. Uh, please reach out to us, email us, call us, text us something if you need anything at all. Uh, this is great to be able to see your faces even though it's through glass. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get back to things before too long. We don't know anything like everybody else. We know that through April 30th, uh, things will remain the same. And you'll be seeing us online and uh, uh, on the farm and in the woods. And uh, also live on Sundays and Wednesdays. And any other time that we feel like going live, we'll put something out there on Facebook. Um, God bless you. We love you. you we, um, we love you. God bless you. We will see you soon. Uh, Lord willing. Amen. Amen.